Welcome to Physics, Chapter 1, Introduction to the Imaging Sciences. The Discovery and Use of X-Rays Dr. Rinken discovered X-Rays November 8, 1895. His full name is Dr. Wilhelm Conrad Rinken, and he was born in Lennep, Germany on March 27, 1845. He received his Ph.D. degree from the University of Zurich in 1869, and he was named director of the newly formed Physics Institute at the University of Würzburg in 1894. And it was in this laboratory that Dr. Rinken forever changed the world of medicine by discovering the X light, as he called it, because X is the term representing the unknown. So he didn't know what an X-ray was. Um, he named it X light, X-ray. Um, we've also heard it called the Rinken ray. But the discovery of X-rays were done in that state-of-the-art laboratory that he was working in. On his death, Dr. Rinken requested that his laboratory notes and books be destroyed, unread. So the exact discovery details vary. It is difficult to establish a full and detailed account of the story of Dr. Rinken's discovery. Um, late on a Friday afternoon, November 8, 1895, Dr. Rinken was working in the laboratory he had prepared a series of experiments involving a cathode ray tube. After setting up the tube and then preparing for the evening's experiments, Dr. Rinken completely covered the tube with black cardboard to continue his study of the fluorescent properties of the cathode rays. On a table a few feet away was a piece of cardboard painted with barium platinocyanide. After beginning his experiments, Dr. Rinken noticed that the piece of cardboard fluoresced each time the tube was energized. The cause could not be the visible light because he had covered the tube with the black cardboard and he checked to be sure no light had escaped. He also knew that the cathode rays could not penetrate the glass walls of the tube. He was consumed by a desire to understand this phenomenon, and he spent several weeks, the next seven weeks actually, investigating it and trying to figure out why the barium platinocyanide <laughs> painted cardboard was fluorescing. Dr. Rinken had prepared a series of experiments involving a cathode ray tube of the Crookes type. It's a partial vacuum tube that produces an electron stream. The nature of the cathode rays was of interest to many scientists of the day and much experimentation was being conducted by several scientists. But of course, the one that we are talking about is Dr. Rinken. It is said that he was so wrapped up in this experiment that he would have his wife bring all of his meals out to the laboratory, and he even had a bed in the laboratory where he would sleep because he did not want to miss any of his research time. He was so thorough with this investigation that he described practically every property of x-rays that we know today. As a part of his investigation, he asked his wife to allow him to photograph her hand with this new X light and on December 22nd, 1895, he produced the first radiograph. And you can see that in the slide here. The first radiograph is of his wife's left hand and we know it's of her left hand because of her wedding ring. And at this moment, a profession was born and thanks to him, we have our career in X-ray. He completed his investigation and he wrote the first of three communications, which are informal papers, 
on the subject of this X light. He submitted the first communication to the secretary of the Wurzburg Physical Medical Society on December 29th, 1895. And he asked that it be published in advance of his scheduled presentation to that society on January 23rd, 1896. His discovery and investigation results were received around the world and everybody was extremely excited about this new finding. He completed and published two more communications on the subject, concluding his initial investigation and results. During Dr. Rankin's investigation of x-rays, which is the term that we use today instead of x-light, he noticed in one series of experiments that the bones of his hand were visible on a barium platinocyanide screen. To capture such an image, he experimented with exposing photographic plates to x-rays and found that they did indeed expose the plate, creating a photograph, now properly referred to as we call it a radiograph. Physicians embraced this new technology and immediately put it to use to find bullets, kidney and gallbladder stones, and broken bones. The public was fascinated by the x-rays because it produced a photograph, most considered it a form of light. In the early days, the cathode ray tubes and generators used for such exposures were inefficient and the x-ray output varied considerably in quantity and quality. Exposure times were commonly in the 20 to 30 minute range. Oh my goodness, that's so long. And some exposures even took up to two hours. Because of this, the early ventures into medical imaging came at a price. Many patients and operators were suffering from acute radiodermatitis, which is radiation burns. There were even cases of electrocution of the operator in setting up the equipment for exposure because the equi equipment was not enclosed, it wasn't grounded, and it was not shielded as it is today. As part of Dr. Rinken's initial communications and presentation, he included the famous photograph, now we call it a radiograph, of his wife Bertha's hand. And that publication of this radiograph led to an almost immediate recognition of the medical value of x-rays. Because radiation burns did not occur during or immediately after the exposure, many in the medical community did not make the connection between that and the x-rays, and they usually attributed it to just the burns to the electrical effects surrounding the x-ray production, such as heat and glow from the electrical arc. Some thought that x-rays were a natural part of sunlight and the burns were just a form of sunburn. Thomas Edison suffered a radiation burn to his face and injury to his left eye from his experimentation with x-rays and after that discontinued his investigations. Because of his experiments, Clarence Daly, Edison's assistant, developed severe radiation burns. The only treatment of his day for such injuries was amputation. During the course of experiments from 1897 to 1903, his left hand above the wrist, four fingers on his right hand, his left arm above the elbow, and then finally his right arm at the shoulder were all amputated. At the end of his life, he was in such pain that he could not lie down and in 1904 died an agonizing death. Many of the early injuries were to technicians, as they were initially called, and doctors who worked with x-rays. Amputations and gloved hands became an identifying trait of their profession. By 1900, improved imaging plates, equipment, and techniques had all but eliminated the acute radiodermatitis. 
but there was still a rather carefree attitude toward investigation and use of x-ray. Within the medical community, recognition of the problems and early efforts to minimize them were underway, but x-rays had also captured the public's imagination in other ways. Immediately after the discovery and announcement, the public imagination went wild with speculation. Imagine a ray that could see through human flesh. Hopes abounded for this new mysterious light, and there was speculation that it would soon be incorporated into a machine that could miraculously cure a host of mortal illnesses. The term x-ray appeared as the subject of poems, songs, and plays. It also appeared in advertisements, like you can see on this slide here, for shoe polishes, ointments, batteries, powders, and the list goes on. Opportunistic advertisers and manufacturers took advantage of the glamour and mania of the word x-ray and incorporated it into a host of products. They said that the x-ray stove polish would clean your stove better. The x-ray headache tablets would cure your headache quickly. X-ray prophylactics would prevent a long list of diseases and then even x-ray golf balls would fly farther and straighter. Of course, x-rays had nothing to do with any of these products effectiveness, only their improved sales. There were unusual applications of x-ray machines built. One of them was called the shoe fitter, and this was a fluoroscope apparatus that was placed in shoe stores to help with the proper fitting of shoes. And we know that a fluoroscope is a device that allows dynamic x-ray exam using x-rays and a fluorescent screen. The advertisement claimed that such machines were vital to ensure comfort through the proper alignment of the bones of the foot within the shoe. Some advertisements stated that this was of particular importance in fitting children's shoes. So they were using this fluoroscope on pediatrics to make sure that their shoes fit. The radiation dose that a child might have received during such a fitting or while playing with the machine as entertainment while the mother and father shopped was incredible. The radiation dose to the salesmen, to the parents that are standing beside the device, and to other customers as well was likely high. As a radiographer, you have to understand the radiologic physics. It is vital to your role as a medical imaging professional. And also you need to have the ability to safely and responsibly use ionizing radiation um, on your patient to make a diagnostic image for the radiologist. Our primary goal in this chapter is to relate the x-ray production process and to tie it into the actual image processing. We have to understand radiologic physics, and you'll need to understand the language of physics in general. You will need to have the knowledge of the general physics formulas that are covered in this chapter and understand the concepts. You must also understand the basic and special radiologic quantities and the units of measure because they are both used regularly in medicine. Um, to better organize how quantities are measured, units are divided and then also subdivided. The foundations of these divisions are the fundamental quantities of mass, length, and time. Each of these are defined using an agreed on standard, which is discussed shortly in the text. But by combining these fundamental quantities, the derived quantities of velocity, the acceleration, the force, the momentum, the work, and the power are formed. These formulas form the foundation of the general language of physics. 
and we will discuss the dose, the dose equivalent, the exposure, and the radioactivity. In this figure here, you can see the fundamental quantities in the foundation units, derived quantities and special radiologic quantities are derived from these. To give true meaning to these quantities, an agreed on unit of measure is needed. So the two systems of measure commonly used in rad sciences are the British system and the SI system or metric system. And the SI means system international. The British system uses the pound as the unit of measure for mass, the foot as the unit of measure for length, and the second as the unit of measure for time. The SI uses the kilogram to quantify mass, the meter for length, and the second to measure time. By combining these fundamental quantities mathematically, you can create derived quantities. Mass is the quantity of matter contained in an object. Matter is anything that occupies space, has shape or form, and has mass. Mass does not change with gravitational force, and it also does not change if the substance changes form. So if we have three kilograms of water and they're frozen, the large ice cube created still has three kilograms of mass. If that ice is melted and boiled away, the water vapor added to the air is still three kilograms. The British system uses the pound to quantify mass. The pound is actually a measure of the gravitational force exerted on the body, also known as weight. For example, a person weighing 120 pounds on Earth weighs 20 pounds on the moon. The SI uses the kilogram to quantify mass. The kilogram is based on the mass of 1,000 cubic centimeters of water at 4 degrees Celsius. And this measure is a constant that does not vary with environment. The SI unit of measure for length is the meter, which is now defined as the distance that light travels in a second. The British system now bases the foot on a fraction of a meter. The second is the unit of measure for time in both systems. This unit of measure has also gone through several definitions but is now measured by an atomic clock that is based on the vibration of cesium atoms. By combining these fundamental quantities mathematically, we can create derived quantities. Of particular interest to rad physics are the derived quantities of velocity, acceleration, force, momentum, work, and power. And to calculate these derived quantities, fundamental quantities, and in some other cases, derived quantities are used. Your unit of measure are agreed on standards that give meaning to specific quantities. Whether the British system or SI is being used, the values and units must be understood by all parties concerned. The fundamental quantities can be combined mathematically to create derived and special quantities for more specific applications. These are the derived quantities, velocity, acceleration, force, momentum, work, and power. Velocity is equal to distance traveled divided by the time necessary to cover that distance. The formula is V equals D divided by T, and its unit of measure is quantity, meters per second. To determine this derived quantity of velocity, the fundamental quantities of length and time are used. So it would be velocity equals distance divided by time. For acceleration, this is found by subtracting the initial velocity of an object from its final velocity and dividing that value by the time used. So the formula is A equals VF 
minus V0 divided by T, in which VF is the final velocity, VO is the original velocity, and T is time. So the formula again is acceleration equals the final velocity minus the original velocity divided by time. The unit of measure is meters per second squared. And then also the fundamental quantities of length and time are used. Distance is the length and it's derived from one, the use of the derived quantity of velocity. The next one is force, and force is a push, a pull, or an other action that changes the motion of an object. It is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by the acceleration. And the formula used is F equals MA, in which M is mass, A is acceleration, and its unit of measure is the Newton. So the formula again is force equals mass times acceleration. For momentum, this is equal to the mass of the object multiplied by its velocity. The formula is P equals MV. P is momentum, M is mass, and V is velocity. So the formula again is momentum equals mass times velocity. And the unit of measure for this is kilograms meters per second. Again, mass, length, and time are used. Length is the distance and time is derived from the use of the velocity. Work is an expression of the force applied to an object multiplied by the distance across which it is applied. The formula for work is work equals F D, and the unit of measure is the joule. So F and D would be the force and the distance. So work equals force times distance. The fundamental quantities of mass, length, and time are used again, and mass and time are derived from the use of force. Power is equal to work divided by time during which work is done. So the formula is P equals work divided by time. And the unit of measure for this one is watts. So again, the formula for power is power equals work divided by time. And the unit of measurement is W, which is watts. Mass and length are derived from the use of work. So these are the formulas that we're using for the units of measure. Two additional concepts are important to radiologic physics, and they are inertia and energy. Inertia is the property of an object with mass that resists a change in its state of motion. In fact, mass is a measure of the amount of inertia that a body possesses. Inertia is just the property of mass, and all objects with mass have inertia. Objects in motion have the additional characteristic of momentum. And then we talked about previously, momentum is the product of mass and the velocity at which mass is the one that is moving. Energy is simply the ability to do work. It has two states, which are potential and kinetic. Potential energy is energy in a stored state. It has the ability to do work by virtue of state or position, a battery um, sitting on a shelf has potential energy in a stored state, but it's not moving. Kinetic energy is energy being expended. So in other words, it is the act of doing work. So the energy in a battery that is running an electronic device is being expended, and this is kinetic state. So when the battery is just sitting on a shelf, it's in a potential state. But then when the battery is hooked up to something and it's running an electronic device, it is in a kinetic state because kinetic energy is energy in motion. <coughs> um, 
Energy exists in a variety of forms. Um, we have electromagnetic energy, which is the form of energy with which the radiologic sciences is most concerned. We have electrical, chemical, and thermal. Electromagnetic energy is a form of energy that exists as an electric and magnetic disturbance in space. Electrical energy is a form that is created by the flow of electricity. Chemical exists through chemical reactions. And thermal energy is a form of energy that exists because of atomic and molecular motion. So in the production of a radiographic image, we're able to trace the transformation of energy from one form to another to create the image. And this is electromagnetic energy. Everything can be categorized as matter, energy, or both. And if we look at Albert Einstein's famous formula, E equals mc squared, this is just an expression of the relationship between matter and energy. And in this formula, E is energy, expressed in joules. M is mass, the quantity of matter contained in an object. And C represents a constant. In this case, um, the constant would be the speed of light. So what this um, equation shows us is the matter. Matter can be transformed into energy, and then energy can be transformed into matter. So that is E equals mc squared. Now we move to the special radiologic quantities. These quantities are uniquely used to quantify the amounts or doses of radiation based on its effects. So we have the Rinken, radiation absorbed dose, radiation equivalent man, and the Curie. The standard units are the Rinken, which is capital R, the Rad, the Rem, and the Curie. The Curie is CI. And we need to note that Rad stands for radiation absorbed dose and REM stands for radiation equivalent man. The SI units are the Coulomb kilogram, the Gray, the Sievert, and the Becquerel. The SI equivalent for the Rinken is the Coulomb per kilogram. For the Rad, it is the Gray. For the REM, it is the Sievert. And for the Curry, it is the Becquerel. Each of the units have specific applications. The Rinken is used to quantify radiation intensity. It's equal to the quantity of radiation that will produce 2.08 times 10 to the 9th power of ion pairs in a cubic centimeter of air. An ion pair is an electron that is removed from an atom and the atom from which it came. The two together are an ion pair. The coulomb per kilogram is a measure of the number of electrons liberated by ionization per kilogram of air. Ionization is the removal of electrons from atoms. One coulomb is the charge associated with 6.24 times 10 to the 18th power electrons. The Rinken or Coulomb per kilogram is generally used as a unit of measure for such phenomena as the output intensity of x-ray equipment or intensity in the air. The relationship between the two is one Rinken equals 2.58 times 10 to the negative four Coulomb per kilogram. To convert Rinkens to Coulombs per kilogram, you multiply the Rinken value by 2.58 times 10 to the negative 4. The RAD is used to quantify the biologic effects of radiation on humans and animals. It's a unit of absorbed dose. So it's called radiation absorbed dose, RAD. It gives measure to the amount of energy deposited by ionizing radiation in any target. So tissues, objects, etc. Not just air like the Rinken. 
One rad is equivalent to 100 ERGS divided by G. And ERG is a unit of energy equal to 10 to the negative 7 joules. Therefore, 100 ERGS divided by G means that 10 neg to the negative 5 joules of energy are transferred per gram of mass. The gray is the SI equivalent, and the relationship between the two is 1 rad equals 10 to the negative 2 grays, which would be 0 0.01 gray. And the way you write gray is capital G and lowercase y. To convert rad to gray, you just multiply the rad value by, z by 0 0.01, and then that will give you the gray. The gray is the unit for absorbed dose. It is an expression of the quantity of radiation energy absorbed by tissues that are being irradiated. The REM is used to quantify occupational exposure or dose equivalent. REM means radiation exposure man. This unit specifically addresses the different biological effects of different types of ionizing radiation to which us as radiation workers may be exposed to. The SI equivalent is the sievert. And the sievert is used to quantify occupational exposure or dose equivalent. The relationship between the two is one rem equals 10 to the negative 2 sieverts, which is 0 0.01 sieverts. And to convert the rem to sieverts, you multiply the rem by 0 0.01. The Curie is used to quantify radioactivity. This unit is an expression of a quantity of radioactive material, not the effect of the radiation emitted from it. So one Curie is the quantity of radioactive material in which 3.7 times 10 to the 10th atoms disintegrate every second. Disintegration or decay is the process by where a radioactive atom gives off particles and energy in an effort to regain the stable state. The SI equivalent is the Becquerel, which is quantifying the number of individual atoms decaying per second. The relationship between the two is 1 Curie is equal to 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerels. To convert Curries to Becquerels, you multiply the Curry value by 3.7 times 10 to the 10th. Generally, radiographic equipment may be classified as mobile or permanently installed. Mobile equipment is a unit on wheels that can be taken to the patient's bedside, the emergency department, surgery, or wherever it may be needed. Permanently installed equipment refers to the units that are fixed in place in the x-ray room, specifically designed for the purpose and are not intended to be mobile at all. Lead shielding or lead equivalent is used in the walls, the doors, and the floors, and other design features are also implemented to restrict the radiation produced to the inside of that room so it doesn't leak out into the nearby adjacent rooms. Permanently installed does not mean that it can never be removed. It just means that it cannot be wheeled to another location. The permanently installed equipment is not only found in um, hospital x-ray departments, but it can also be in imaging centers, outpatient centers, special surgery suites, 
And then also large emergency departments will have their own permanently installed equipment in the actual surgery um, and emergency department areas. Um, so I used to work at a hospital that had two permanently installed um, equipment. They had two x-ray rooms inside the ER. So it was just strictly for emergency room patients. And then we had four permanently installed rooms in the main department of the hospital. Permanently installed equipment consists of the tube, the collimator, the table, the control console, the tube stand, and the wall unit. And in this picture here, you're able to see the inside of the x-ray tube and the inside of the collimator housing. The x-ray tube, the collimator, and the tube stand can be discussed together as the tube head assembly. The x-ray tube has two electrodes. It is a special diode tube that converts electrical energy into x-rays and it produces heat as a byproduct. The positive electrode is called the anode and the negative is called the cathode. The tube is oriented so that generally the anode is over the head of the table and the cathode is over the foot. When facing the x-ray tube assembly, the anode is typically on the radiographer's left and the cathode is on the right. Both heat and x-rays are produced, so the tube is encased in a special tube housing and this housing is made of metal and has a special mounting bracket for the x-ray tube and the high voltage receptacles to deliver the electricity to the x-ray tube. The housing is also filled with oil that surrounds the x-ray tube and this helps to dissipate the heat that is produced. There's cooling fans that are built into the housing and that also helps to dissipate the heat. Below the x-ray tube, you have the collimator, and it is a box-shaped device, and it's attached to the bottom of the housing. The collimator serves to restrict the x-ray beam, so that beam restriction and um, getting that field size smaller and just to the area of interest of the body, and it helps localize the beam to that area. The collimator is fitted with two pairs of lead shutters, controlled by two buttons, and that will alter the width and the length of the beam. The collimator also contains a light source, a mirror and a clear plastic covering over the bottom, and it has crosshairs imprinted on it. And this will give you your central ray. The mirror reflects the light source through the plastic and casts a shadow of the crosshairs onto the patient. The shutters adjust the size of the light field, which represents the radiation field that will be produced. The light field and the crosshairs show the radiographer the dimensions of the x-ray field and where it will enter the patient's body. So again, that's your central ray and you're able to see that when you're positioning the patient, you put those crosshairs right exactly where your central ray is. Um, if this tube head assembly is mishandled, the collimator mirror can be bumped out of, <clears throat> out of adjustment, and so we'll have to get that fixed. Um, periodically, we do a control test called a radiation field or light field test and this is conducted to check the mirror, make sure the mirror is not bumped into any direction, make sure it's in line where it's supposed to be. Because if it's not in line where it's supposed to be, your central ray is going to be off. The tube stand or tube mount is the portion of the tube head assembly that gives mobility to the x-ray tube. This allows us to take images from a variety of angles and it allows us to accommodate the patient's condition. There are three basic configurations of the tube stand. We have the floor mount, 
the floor ceiling or floor wall mount, and the overhead tube assembly, which we call the ceiling mount. The floor mount consists of a horizontal track or rail mounted on the floor parallel to the long axis of the table. A vertical piece that rides on the rail and an arm to which the x-ray tube is attached. This type of assembly is limited in its application and it's best suited for low volume workloads and just basic examinations. The floor ceiling mount is a variation of the floor mount. And you can see that um, figure A, the picture to the left. The second point of attachment for the vertical piece adds stability. It's a slight modification and it is called the floor wall mount. Both of these variations have the same limitations in movement as the floor mount and are best suited to the same type of environment and workload as the floor mount. You can see in figure B, that is a ceiling mount. That's an overhead tube assembly, and it's the most widely used in hospital settings and most versatile in design. So if you ever work at a level one trauma center, they will have these ceiling mounts actually in their trauma bays. So you don't even have to take a portable machine in there because they have these ceiling mounts in every trauma bay. So for the ceiling mount, um, with this design, there are two rails that are mounted on the ceiling running along the long axis of the room. And to this is attached an overhead tube crane, as you can see in um, image B. The crane itself allows the tube to move side to side as well as to telescope up and down. It can rotate around its axis and it can roll horizontally to point towards the wall. So it allows you to basically do everything. Um, there's a ton of room because it's mounted to the ceiling. And it, you know, with the, with the one in figure A, with the tube stand or the floor mount, um, you have limited amount of movement. But with the ceiling mount, there's no limitations. You can move it all the way around the room with the tracks and it rotates all around and it's just so much easier when we're doing trauma exams in the trauma bay that we have you know no limitations at all the modern table for a general radiography room permits height adjustment so that the patient can easily get on and off the table and so that the radiographer can place the table at a comfortable work height. It also has a four-way floating top with electromagnetic locks. The locks release with a foot pedal and the table top then floats easily in any direction for ease and patient positioning. So we don't have to move the patient, we just move the table. Just under the tabletop is the Bucky assembly. And a variation of this table used with fluoro equipment has a chain drive and a motor to move the tabletop side to side and head to foot. It also has a mechanism to tilt the table 30 degrees towards the head and 90 degrees towards the feet. So you can put the patient in a Trendelenburg by angling it 30 degrees towards the head, tilting the table, or you can stand the patient up they can be laying down on the table and then you can move the table to a complete 90 degrees towards the feet and you'll have a, a foot stand at the bottom of the table where the patients will basically stand up. And this allows the radiographer to, pay, uh, to place the patient in Trendelenburg, which is head down or in a standing position safely. The wall unit consists of a vertical rail assembly affixed to the wall 
and the floor, and a vertical bucky assembly. The rail allows for adjustment of the height of the vertical bucky, and the vertical bucky is the same as the horizontal bucky in the table and serves the same purpose. The wall unit allows the radiographer to easily perform upright examinations. The control panel provides the radiographer with control of all of the parameters necessary to produce the diagnostic image. So we call this our technique. We use the control panel to select the kilovoltage and the milliamperage that is applied to the x-ray tube to produce the x-rays. There are all kinds of different functions available to us, such as the anatomic program, the focal spot, the automatic exposure control or the AEC, and Bucky selection, as well as the details of the kilovoltage and the milliamperage selection or your KV and your MA. The control panel allows the radiographer to modify and fine tune the exposure parameters to obtain the best image, dependent on the part being examined, the patient's size, and also the patient's age, um, and any pathologies that may be present. Uh, we will have to adjust our technique for that as well. So there's nothing magical about this process. We're basically manipulating electricity and um, changing factors that literally control the electricity applied to the x-ray tube to produce the x-rays and create the image. It is the radiographer's responsibility to minimize radiation dose to the patient, to their self, and to others in accordance with the ALARA principle. The ALARA principle stands for as low as reasonably achievable. So basically what this means is we want to use the least amount of radiation possible, but to be able to get a diagnostic image. So we do have to use radiation to get that diagnostic image, but we want to use as low as reasonably achievable where we can still give the patient the least amount of radiation but also getting the best possible diagnostic image. It is the radiographer's responsibility again to limit radiation dose to the patient, to themselves, and to others in the area. And it is a violation of the ARRT and the ASRT code of ethics to do otherwise. The ARRT certifies individuals on passing the certifying examination as competent to be entry-level radiographers and maintain a registry of individuals who maintain the competence through continuing education and recertification. As a part of this process, we have a standards of ethics document that consists of two parts the ARRT Code of Ethics, and the ARRT Rules of Ethics. Item number seven of the current document deals most directly with radiation protection. And it specifically states that the radiographer is to demonstrate expertise in minimizing radiation exposure to the patient, to themselves, and to other members of the healthcare team. So we want to make sure and primarily minimize the entrance skin exposure to us, to the patient, and to other healthcare workers. So central to minimizing radiation dose to ourselves and to others are the cardinal principles of shielding time and distance. So we are trying to minimize the radiation dose by using these cardinal principles. Shielding refers to the use of the radiopaque materials, which x-rays do not pass through easily, which would be lead. We want to greatly reduce radiation exposure to areas of the patient that are not essential to the exam being performed. We want to um, minimize radiation to the radiographers during the exams. 
and then to other healthcare workers. So we use lead impregnated materials, such as lead aprons, thyroid shields, um, lead shielding, lead glass. So shielding is a big one. We want to increase our shielding and that will decrease our entrance skin exposure. With time, time refers to the duration of the exposure to the ionizing radiation and the time spent in a healthcare environment where exposure to ionizing radiation is going on. So this may include the length of, length of the exposure, the number of times the patient is exposed for a radiologic exam, or the time a radiographer spends in fluoroscopy suite. So in surgery, in pain medicine, um, in doing fluoros fluoroscopic exams in the department, any procedure involving fluoro. Whether we're referring to the patient, the radiographer, or other healthcare workers, the general rule of thumb is to always minimize your time. We want to limit the length of time exposed to the ionizing radiation. So to decrease our entrance skin exposure, we want to decrease the time. And then the next one is distance. Distance refers to the space between us and the source of ionizing radiation. So the reason that distance is important is because the intensity or quantity of radiation gets weaker or diminishes over distance. So we want to stand as far as we can. The National Council of Radiation Protection tells us to be at least six feet away. And that is why the cord on the portable x-ray machine exposure button is six foot from the portable machine. So it's six foot from the primary beam. So we want to be at least six feet away from the source of radiation. Um, the intensity of radiation is going to be more the closer you are to it. So if we can get further from the primary beam, we're going to be increasing our distance and we're going to be decreasing the entrance skin exposure. So again, we want to increase shielding, decrease time, and increase our distance. So now we're talking about tools and radiation protection. So another important tool is the limiting of the field x-ray exposure, which is called beam restriction. The primary tool for beam restriction is the collimator. And using this device, we are limiting the area of exposure. We're limiting the radiation dose to the patient. And we're, um, that is the smaller the area of extra exposure, the lower the total dose to the patient. Um, when we discuss radi radiation interactions in the body, we're talking about X-ray photons interacting with the atoms of the tissue. So the greater the volume of tissue we expose, the greater the opportunity for these interactions with the atoms to occur. With these interactions, the photons energy will either be totally absorbed, which contributes to the patient dose, or be scattered, which is going to contribute to dose to the radiographers and then other people in the area. We must consider the total volume of tissue that we expose to the x-ray beam and limit it to only that necessary to produce a quality image. Next we have the primary controls of the x-ray beam which is KVP and mass these are the factors selected by the radiographer to produce the x-ray beam and given quality or the penetrating power controlled by the KVP and the quantity, the number of photons controlled by the mass. The combination of the KVP and mass is selected based on a number of considerations. <coughs> the anatomic part being examined, the patient's age, the condition of the patient, the pathology, 
and so on. So we should be ideally suited to the circumstance to minimize the radiation dose while producing a quality image. There are a number of daily workflow tasks and processes that address radiation protection. A major one for us serves as a frontline advocate for the patient is the avoidance of duplicate exams. So we want to get it right the first time, right? So get it right the first time, avoid repeats, and then that will cut down the radiation exposure to the patient. Also, screening for pregnancy is another important task that we need to do to minimize unnecessary exposure to a developing fetus. We want to use sufficient time and concentration. So take your time, you know, make sure that you're thinking about everything that you need to do before you push the exposure button so that you can get it right the first time. You can develop a mental checklist for radiographic procedures and then perform it the same way every time. Have a routine. And if you have that routine, you probably won't forget as much as you would if you did not have the routine. So get into a routine so that the mistakes are minimal and then the unnecessary radiation dose to the patient is minimized. 